Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Danny for the invitation. Uh, there are actually two people without whom I wouldn't be here. One is Danny, the other one is, uh, you might know him on Ofri, but he's not here right now. Uh, if it weren't for the two of them, I wouldn't be speaking to you. Uh, starting to talk after Paulo's presentation is kind of difficult, and I'm putting a peculiar dilemma because most of the themes and issues I would uh, approach and deal with uh, were already developed by him. So uh, I try to make the issues uh, at the same time more local, and uh, I'll try to reflect those uh, tendencies uh, that were expressed uh, by Paulo and by the previous uh, two lecturers here. Uh, I'll try to shed some light on some issues uh, that may be a little bit uh, not really deeply dealt with. But first, uh, I'd like to have two short uh, anecdotes, so to say. Uh, one is uh, some kind of methodological background that plagues every student or professor or researcher of Middle Eastern history or Islamic studies. Uh, the historian Chase Robinson, uh, in an article entitled Method and Theory, the Study of, of Islamic Origins, uh, and the subtitle is uh, Reconstructing Early Islam Truth and Consequences, uh, which you have to attend to. He affirms that the totalizing definition of Islam as a civilization and a program uh, is the resulting part of modernism. So he proposes to let go of the term Islam uh, in historical explanation, uh, which is uh, a daring but uh, very needed uh, approach or concept to take. Uh, there are two problems uh, and or two very difficult consequences of, of this approach. Uh, one is to historicize and question the tradition, which he says, quote, uh, will serve to subvert the epistemological authority of modernist traditionalism. And what he calls modernist traditionalism uh, is indeed uh, the recreation of tradition by uh, modern political, sociological, and academic uh, trends. Uh, so we have a in one side, uh, double-edged swords. And on the other side, uh, this is a very difficult enterprise because uh, it also serves uh, to show, for example, uh, how the notion of jihad, which I have dealt with, is dangerously uh, akin to the historical notion. So that all those who try to, in Robinson's terms, to domesticate Islam or make Islam look uh, glorious and tolerant, uh, they are really remaking history and composing a tradition according to modernist lines. Uh, the consequences of this are very serious for the study of Islam and the Middle East, uh, what he calls uh, the mealy-mouthed, quote-unquote, Western academic who offers ironic platitudes. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this kind of uh, so-called research, they thrive in academia, both uh, abroad and, and here. So uh, Paulo has already dealt with the, with, with the two legends. Both of them are, uh, but it is, uh, it's hard to defy the, this so-called status quo, that, uh, uh, it's to take some distance from books like, uh, from uh, uh, an American professor called Juan Cole, who's entitled Muhammad, the Prophet of Peace, among the clash of empires. So this, these are serious books written by uh, quote unquote serious uh, scholars uh, trying to paint a theological image of Muhammad under the guise of uh, history or uh, sociology or whatever, uh, which only amounts to actually some fancy whitewashing of history. Uh, the second consequence of s subverting the tradition, uh, it does, it's costly. It's, personally costly and is uh, intellectually uh, very demanding. Uh, there is a case of uh, a study of the Hadith, those traditions recounted by the followers of Muhammad, and uh, he seems to be alleviated uh, because he concluded that uh, Hadith that 
uh, in which Muhammad says that women are deficient in religion and intelligence, the Sadith uh, is not trustworthy. I mean, it's probably false. But uh, here we have a dilemma in which believing that the Hadiths are true, as most so-called Orthodox Muslims believe, uh, would lead to believe that Muhammad, in fact, was a mis misogynist. And uh, if you don't believe the Hadiths are true, you're not really an Orthodox Muslim. And uh, according to some mainstream uh, presentations of Islam, that is not acceptable either. So. Uh, maybe all those uh, background questions I'm raising here are kind of esoteric to international relations students, but they have uh, should be brought to bear on how we consider, how we approach uh, Middle Eastern history. Uh, because most of these, uh, what the French call, uh, uh, they are transmitted from generation of, to generation of uh, professors uncritically. I mean, Muhammad really was, as uh, the tradition tells, the caliphs really were, as the tradition tells, and so on and so on. Uh, the second uh, very short introduction uh, was just kind of personal. Uh, uh, most of you uh, haven't, maybe haven't realized yet, but everything we're telling here uh, from Paulo and from the, the previous presentations also, uh, if you know some Lebanese or Syrian or Middle Eastern, everything sounds personal. Uh, even if we try to disguise it under uh, some beautiful varnish of uh, academic scholarly language, uh, it is not. Uh, we try to, but uh, we have to admit it's not uh, easy nor feasible uh, in the long run. The first uh, short story is uh, what ha happened last year when I was in Jerusalem. Uh, it was uh, uh, late Friday. Uh, I was uh, walking alone, and there's a little, little street, and I chanced upon it's called the Greek uh, Patriarchate Street near Jaffa Gate. Uh, and I decided to come in because my family actually it's uh, Greek Catholic, so I asked to see a church, take some pictures, we got it, I had nothing better to do anyway. Uh, but then uh, there are people speaking in French inside the church, and uh, of course my Arabic is not very good, so I started speaking French. Uh, and uh, the little guy who was talking to me was impressed, first because I was a Greek Catholic, and then because I spoke French. And this guy told me, I, I'm the Archbishop. And I had no idea that he invited me to go to the rooftop, a very beautiful view of the Dome of the Rock, et cetera, et cetera. And he said he learned French uh, when he was a child in Egypt because his mother was French and his father was Greek, and how come? Now, this story has something to do with uh, uh, the creation of the communities uh, that Paulo has already commented on. Uh, and the second thing that Often, uh, often happens is that uh, when I'm trying to teach my students, uh, it's not rare to someone to come to me and said, uh, "Why are you Muslim?" I said, "No," and the guy says, "What are you?" It's like a weird question, uh, and I say, oh, oh, "I'm Greek Catholic or whatever or Maronite," and the student says, "Oh, so therefore you speak French?" I said, "Oh, yes." Uh, but this connection uh, may be uh, sometimes, uh, th that is one of those uh, ideas that go on and on and on, that uh, Melchites or Maronites are francophiles. They really love the French. Uh, the saying, as the saying goes, the, the, the Maronites call the French, uh, my dear mama. Uh, why am I telling these uh, two uh, stories, which may seem too prosaic uh, and unrelated to huge international relations, uh, world processes, trends, etc.? Uh, that is why, actually, I chose uh, to speak when to take a perspective on speaking about uh, religious diversity in the Ottoman Empire to focus on interreligious relations. Uh, because interreligious relations are uh, enmeshed, uh, interwoven in 
the whole of the Tanzimat period, the reform period of the Ottoman Empire in the 1830s to uh, the 1850s. Uh, the focus of those reforms were actually uh, to change the relations between the Ottoman state and uh, those communities, uh, in great part because of the pressure of uh, uh, the world powers. Uh, those issues also have to bear upon uh, various kinds of nationalism that were rising uh, from French Revolution onwards. Uh, of course, uh, they have also a uh, great deal to do with international relations that we will dealt with uh, tomorrow. Uh, they also have uh, something to do with uh, the insertion in uh, the world economy, world capitalist economy in the late uh, 19th century. Uh, and, of course, they have to uh, do with the composition and construction of religious identities, both Muslim, uh, Jewish, and uh, Christian religious identities uh, in the Middle East from the late 19th century onwards. Uh, I won't uh, take my time talking about uh, tolerance attitudes and uh, the origin of the Islam's uh, Islamic attitudes toward all the religions, because Paulo has already responded in it uh, very well. Uh, I would just like to uh, mention two uh, sources for the discussion uh, of those attitudes uh, with some, not with some detail. Uh, the first one uh, is the uh, Quranic verse that says, uh, everybody here must have heard it uh, sometime in their lives. Everybody likes to cite it as a great example of how tolerant Islam is. Uh, that is the verse uh, two, uh, Surah 2, verse 256 of the Quran that says, there is no compulsion in religion. True guidance has become distinct from error. So whoever rejects false gods and believes in God has grasped the firmest handhold, etc., etc. Uh, according to Patricia Crown, that is a historian of uh, early Islam, uh, there were several interpretations of this verse. And from the very fact that there are several interpretations of, of this verse, we can conclude that there are there is never, as Paulo said, uh, a homogeneous attitude uh, that we can apply these uh, interpretations or laws uh, across all uh, Muslim-dominated peoples uh, in all periods of history. Uh, Patricia Crown cites some interpretations, such as the first one, that uh, this verse doesn't apply at all because it was abrogated. Uh, there was a time when uh, Muhammad had to uh, make deals with the, uh, and bear the, the, the persecution in Mecca by the pagans, but then at that time he didn't have power. When Muhammad grew in power, that verse doesn't apply anymore. Uh, one other interpretation is that it was restricted uh, in time, because this verse only applied, that is a very peculiar interpretation, this verse only applies to Muslims of Medina who couldn't convert their own children. Uh, the most common interpretation has, uh, is that it, the verse only applied to people of the book. So there is a guide called uh, Amr Abdul Aziz, who is a friend of Yusuf al-Khadawi, who is a very famous preacher uh, in the Middle East, that said this verse was revered, uh, revealed specifically about Christians and Jews. As Paul said, idolaters and similar godless and permissive people have to be compelled to accept Islam. They do not deserve any consideration because of their so I'll quote, godlessness, stupidity, error, and foolishness. So this is a kind of a very traditional uh, perspective uh, of Islamic and non-Islamic relations. So uh, the attitude of the Muslim government toward the so-called people of the book, Nahl al-Kitab, Nahl al-Dima, may be considered uh, in some, by having some ambiguity, some kind of, uh, as a historian describes, uh, Muslim leaders combine tolerance on one hand with the scorn and persistent mild denigration of Christian beliefs on the other. So this treatment combines some various inducements, okay, uh, tax breaks, professional opportunities, made conversion to Islam quite attractive for the Christian people placed under Muslim rule. So uh, the question one might ask if, uh, Islam, if Islam was so tolerant, why did people really need to convert to Islam? Uh, Muslims have a uh, ready-made answer because Islam is great, because we're powerful, rich, and because Islam is the truth. 
uh, but actually uh, there are kind of other kinds of sociological and more prosaic incentives uh, like uh, I won't deal with it in detail, but uh, Muslim migration, uh, marriage uh, by Muslim men and non-Muslim women, uh, and in fact, what uh, some people say is oppressive taxation. Some people say the the, the jizya weren't really uh, a strain, but there there is some evidence that in some period, uh, in some places, uh, the what what the, 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 the tax imposed on non-Muslims was a uh, severe handicap, both on rich and poor people. Uh, when dealing with uh, religion in the Ottoman Empire, when I was first proposed this uh, issue by, by Danny, uh, I started thinking about uh, how to deal with this uh, uh, bewildering complexity in 30, 40 minutes. Okay, so. To give you a taste what what this uh, lecture could be, I could speak about, for example, the bureaucratization of the ulema class, the religious class, which was uh, uh, particular to the uh, Ottoman Empire. We don't find this hierarchy uh, uh, in previous uh, Islamic empires. Uh, I could talk about the plurality of uh, within Islam. I could talk about the so-called uh, fundamentalist revolts uh, within the Ottoman Empire, or I could talk about just the uh, non-Muslim populations, mainly Christian Orthodox Christians uh, in the Balkans, or I could talk about the relation of those populations with uh, European powers. So uh, the Ottoman Empire, when we choose, uh, the Europeans chose to, to call the Ottoman Empire a Turk Empire, is actually a very complicated statement. Because the Ottomans themselves didn't consider themselves, uh, uh, as we would say today, ethnically Turks. What they called the Turks were the poor, ignorant peasants of Anatolia. They called themselves Ottomans. Uh, that means that it was an empire that wasn't defined uh, ethnically. It was defined by the allegiance, uh, both religious and political, uh, to a ruling dynasty. So. Uh, there is a very serious dangers in conflating uh, ethnical groups, religious groups, and uh, political groups from the beginning to, to the very end of the Ottoman Empire. To give you uh, a list of examples, for example, the Albani Albanians, they could be Muslims, but both Sunni and Bektashi, the mystical Sufi Sunnis. Uh, they could be Catholics, they could be Orthodox. The Bulgarians could be Pomaks, that is Muslims. The Greeks and Bosnians could be Orthodox and Muslims. The Turks could be Sunni, Shia, Sufi, etc., etc. Uh, there were ethnic Jews converted to Islam, who some called uh, the crypto Jewish, the Donmi. Uh, the Kurds could be Yazidis or uh, Sunni. Uh, the Jews could be Arabs, Mizrahim, Sephardim, etc. Uh, the Greeks, they could be. Uh, what, what was called the Greeks, the room, they are not really Greek be, uh, in the sense that they spoke Greek, they could speak uh, Turkish. And the Arabs are the most complicated of all because they could be, as, as Paul has already uh, mentioned, Sunni, Shia, Druze, Alawi, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, or whatever you may wish to put into this weird list. Uh, there is a quote here by uh, Turkish historian Selim Deringil, who asked the question, who is an Ottoman, anyway? Was his Sadiq Pasha named Michael Isidore Tchaikovsky, a Polish count who entered the Ottoman service? Was, was he a Mirbashir Shihab, the Christian Lebanese who practiced Sunni Islam in public and Christianity in private? Or was he the Jews Alawish chieftain of the Lebanese mountains who pressed Takia and recurred to Sharia courts? Or was he finally the weirdest case I've found in history, the Grand Vizier Mehmed Sokol, who was really called Sokolovich, who had uh, imposed his brother on the uh, Serbian church patriarchate at Pech. Uh, so uh, this confluence of uh, powers, uh, both between uh, ecclesiastical and uh, uh, political and religious powers in the Ottoman Empire, was uh, not the, the, the 
not something to be amazed at. It was the day-to-day -day basis of the of the Ottoman power. Uh, and national identities in the people of the Balkans much later in the peoples of the Middle East uh, were only uh, crystallized uh, in the late, I would dare say, in the late 19th century, so that uh, ethnical and linguistic identities, as already uh, mentioned, uh, they don't, uh, they are a product uh, of nationalism and some kind of identity construction. For example, the Bulgarian language uh, at a 19th century is estimated to have 50% of Turkish uh, vocabulary. So even the languages that were the base of uh, the languages and religions that were the base for uh, the nationalism uh, insurrections in Eastern Europe were, dare I say, invented. 